But I want to mention a flail chest. Now a flail chest is where two or more ribs are broken in two or more places and you get a bit of the chest wall which is disconnected from the rest of the chest wall. So I could maybe illustrate this on the model here. So like if uh, you have rib fractures here and here and here and here, possibly even here and here. And I think you can see what we have here is a section of chest wall which is disconnected from the rest of the chest wall. And this can be associated with so-called paradoxical movements. So as the rest of the ribs go up and out, that flail segment can be sucked in. The movement can be opposite to the rest of the chest wall. But particularly with a flail segment, that means there's been a lot of trauma. And if there's been a lot of trauma, if the, here we have some um, we have a flail segment here, these ribs are damaged then this means there's probably significant insult to the underlying lung, causing an area of pulmonary contusion. Contusion, remember, is where there's hemorrhage very often from the small blood vessels and blood is leaking out into the tissue spaces, compromising the function of the lung. And actually, pulmonary contusion may or may not be associated with rib fractures. You can get it with rib fractures, or you can get it without rib fractures. Now, another classic problem with chest trauma can be cardiac tamponade. Tamponade is where an organ is compressed. So, as you probably know, the pericardium around about the heart. Let's try. Let's pretend this is the heart. I know this is a bit of wrong. Let's pretend that's the heart. There's a fibrous sac called the pericardium around about it. And if there's any bleeding into the pericardial sac, then the blood will bleed into the pericardial sac. And as it fills up with blood, the pericardial sac won't stretch significantly because it's tough fibrous tissue. So it won't stretch significantly. And that means the heart inside is going to be progressively compressed meaning it can't work properly at all and that's going to cause shock an immediate life-threatening condition cardiac tamponade with blood in the pericardial sac and also when there's chest injury you can get blunt trauma to the heart as well compromising cardiac function and there's various other types of chest injuries that you can learn about but what I've covered in these ones it's just some of the main principles, the common things that we see to try and get a, a feel for how we're going to manage a patient with chest trauma. But now we're going to look at these in a little more detail on the notes. So thinking about super simple pneumothorax where there's no tension effects the presentation, there's going to be reduced breath sounds on the effective side. Hyperresonance to percussion because the chest is more hollow than normal. Hypoxia because of reduced lung function and reduced oxygenation of the blood. Hypercarbia because it may well be harder for the lungs to breathe out the carbon dioxide which is in the blood. And chest x-ray can, can confirm the diagnosis where you'll see a much darker area where the pneumothorax is. Now thinking about the causes of simple pneumothorax, well penetrating injury of course, this will give rise to the open sucking sort of chest wound. Blunt trauma is another possibility where there might be lung laceration because the air can get into the pleural space from the alveoli as well as from the outside air. So blunt trauma is another possible cause. And especially if there's positive pressure ventilation, this becomes quite dangerous because it can develop into a tension pneumothorax. Another possible cause is thoracic spine uh, vert vertebral fracture with displacement, which can 
the sharp bits of the fractured vertebrae can go into the, the pleural membrane. Now what about the management? Well we mentioned that we can do uh, overlapping dressing secured on three sides to provide a flutter valve effect so that the air can get out but not get in. We're going to need a chest drain which should be remote from the wound. We don't put chest drains through the wound because of the risk of infection. After the chest drain is in, the patient will be re-x-rayed to see if the pneumothorax is being reduced. Any patient with a simple pneumothorax is at risk of developing a tension pneumothorax so we would want to observe these patients carefully for any tension effects. And sometimes we might need surgical closure of the initial wound. Now, a tension pneumothorax develops when there's a flap from the lung or the outside air into the pleural space, allowing air in but not out and the pressure will build up causing tension or pressure effects and it's a clinical diagnosis reflecting air under pressure in the pleural space it's a clinical diagnosis because there probably is not time to get the patient a chest x-ray and the lung will completely collapse now a patient could be admitted with a tension pneumothorax or it may develop from a simple pneumothorax but it also occurs iatrogenically while the patient is under our care particularly if this patient receives positive pressure ventilation or sometimes chest lines for example a line going into the subclavian vein might accidentally puncture the pleural space it can also develop if someone puts a occlusive dressing over a chest wound as well over a sucking chest wound because the air might still be getting in but not getting out so the treatment can't be delayed for radiographic confirmation so we might see tracheal deviation the, the trachea being pushed away from the affected side we may see neck vein distension on the affected side as the blood finds it difficult to drain back into the chest because it is under increased pressure. There may be chest pain, air hunger, not surprisingly respiratory distress, and tachycardia and hypotension because of the compression of the major blood vessels. There'll be unilateral absence of breath sounds, that is, on the lung affected by the tension pneumothorax, there won't, won't be breath sounds, but there will be hyperresonance and eventually there's going to be cyanosis. So particularly thinking about absent breath sounds and hyperresonance. Needle thoracocentesis with a large bore cannula can be an emergency measure to turn the tension pneumothorax into an open pneumothorax. Mid clavicular line, second intercostal space. And then a chest drain in the fourth or fifth intercostal space which is round about nipple level and just anterior to the mid axillary line. Hemothorax. Well, a hemothorax is often described as less than 1500 mils of blood in the pleural space. This might be caused by lung laceration, damage to an intercostal vessel, maybe even damage to the internal mammary artery but the key thing is with a hemothorax that's not over 1500 mils when there's less than 1500 mils of blood is it is usually self-sealing hemostasis can normally be established physiologically without surgical intervention but a massive hemothorax is over 1500 mils of blood lost or a third of the patient's blood volume that would be a massive hemothorax and this is usually damage to systemic or hyalur vessels, the vessels going in and out of the lung hilum. There'll be shock associated with reduced breath sounds. So the patient's going to be shocked because they're bleeding. There's going to be reduced breath sounds because the 
area that was occupied by lung is now occupied by hemothorax. And the difference between that and attention pneumothorax is there's dullness to percussion. Because there's blood in there, it's going to give a dull note to percussion. The patient's going to need a chest drain, intravenous fluids, crystalloid fluids, followed by type-specific blood. If possible, do collect the blood for autotransfusion. Ventilations might also be inhibited, giving rise to a degree of hypoxia. And in a massive haemothorax, prepare for thoracotomy. We need a thoracic surgeon to close off the bleeding large vessels to save this patient's life. So flail chest is where two or more ribs are broken in two or more places, giving an isolated area of the chest wall. And these patients might be hypoxic, partly from the flail chest, but also because the trauma very often is associated with pulmonary contusion. If there's a flail chest, it means the patient has had a lot of trauma and the underlying lung is likely to be contused, both giving rise to hypoxia. So two or more ribs fractured in two or more places means there's going to be disruption of the chest wall movement. And this patient, if they're at all conscious, is going to be in an awful lot of pain because rib fractures are very painful. And the pain is significant, firstly because the patient is suffering, but the pain is also significant because the pain will inhibit chest wall movements and that's going to make the hypoxia worse. So the pain will make the hypoxia worse because it will inhibit chest wall movements. And where the flail segment is, there may well be this paradoxical movement, with the flail segment being sucked in when the rest of the ribs go out. So we need to ensure adequate ventilation and oxygenation of these patients with humidified oxygen. In trauma, good oxygenation of the patient is of absolute importance. Now the patients may well need fluids and we must give adequate amounts of fluids but we want to do so judiciously because if we over infuse patients we are more likely to get pulmonary edema and that will make the pulmonary contusion worse. So adequate but judicious administration of intravenous fluids. Analgesics are very important and these might be local, you might get an anaesthetist to do some local anaesthesia to take away the pain, giving local anaesthetics, or we might be give systemic analgesia. Because what we want to do is improve the movement of the chest wall and if we can do that, that might maintain the patient's oxygen levels and we might not need to give them more invasive forms of ventilation if we can give them good analgesia. But we might use CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, and as a last resort, of course, we might need possible intubation and ventilation for a period of time. So pulmonary contusion is talking about bruising of the lung, pulmonary contusion. And actually this is the most common potentially lethal chest injury. And it can be associated with flail segment and uh, rib fractures, but not necessarily associated with rib fractures. And the respiratory failure associated with pulmonary contusion can develop slowly over a period of time, meaning that we need to observe patients with chest trauma very carefully in case they're becoming hypoxic as a result of the pulmonary contusion. And if the oxygen saturations drop below 
or the PaO2 is less than 8.6 kilopascals, that is less than 65 millimetres of mercury, while the patient's breathing room air, we may need to consider that they might need intubation and uh, ventilation because of the pulmonary contusion, because it's vital that we keep these patients oxygenated until the contusion in the lung resolves and the inflammation goes down. Cardiac tamponade, bleeding into the pericardial sac, compressing the heart. So the pericardium is a fixed structure, and if there's bleeding into the pericardial sac, it won't expand, that means the bleeding is going to compress the heart inside. And this is a case, a cause of non-response to fluids. Now we've mentioned before that the most common cause of shock in trauma is hypovolemia. And when we give fluids, we would expect some response. But here we're not going to get a response because the shock is not caused by hypovolemia, it's caused by cardiac compression. And this is usually caused by penetrating injuries, but can also be present in blunt trauma. So there's going to be increased venous pressure because there's going to be a backlog of blood because the venous return into the atria is going to be inhibited because of the pressure within the pericardial sac. There's going to be reduced blood pressure because the heart is not getting the venous return so it can't pump the blood out. And although it's very hard to listen for, you might be able to detect muffled heart sounds. And I haven't spaced it very well, but actually these three are sometimes referred to as Beck's triad. So increased venous pressure with the non-response, shock, the hypertension patient's hypotensive, and possible muffled heart sounds, and they're not going to respond to fluids. So an echocardiogram can be useful to see the blood, or a focused assessment sonography and trauma, a so-called FAST scan. And a pericardiosynthesis might be necessary to drain the blood out of the pericardial sac, to allow the heart to expand again. And this is going to allow a diagnosis and also relieve the immediate symptoms. Now, if it's a small bleed, this may be adequate for treatment. But if it's a large bleed, all this is going to do is buy time while we get a thoracic surgical opinion as an emergency. So obviously penetrating injuries can damage the heart, but blunt injuries can damage the heart as well. Very often as a result of rapid deceleration, the sort of injuries we see after road traffic collisions or falls. And this might lead to damage to the heart such as myocardial contusion. And it can lead to dysrhythmias and it can lead to hypotension. 